Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anne Sue. I'm one of the faculty members here. I teach, among other things, constitutional law. Um, I'll be chairing this panel, the very interesting panel that we have for today. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the huron Wenda, um, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this land is still home to many indigenous people working to reclaim their rights to some determination. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Although we may be joining from different places, we invite you to reflect on the history and relations of the land that you're on. The topic also I should note that we will be discussing today is salient and of serious concern uh, to many indigenous communities. So a few logistics before we begin. Uh, each speaker will have about five to 10 minutes uh, for their initial comments, and then we can have a question and answer period afterwards. But before I introduce uh, today's speakers, um, Professor Trudeau Lemons would like to say a word about the composition of the panel. Yes, so I would like to uh, welcome everyone and uh, thank particularly Professor Sue for sharing, uh, for sharing this session. Uh, also, the media team at the Faculty of Law, Deborah Lindsay and Nina Haikara, for the idea of putting this panel together. So this was together, put together in a very short period of time because it's a time we talk, and it could not be more timely, and we didn't predict that actually when they thought about putting this panel together that we would have yesterday and today and the coming days debate at both the House of Commons and the Senate level on a governmental bill uh, that would uh, further postpone the introduction of grief for mental illness. So it's a very timely topic, uh, and we were we were say, certainly keen to have this in in a more debate format. So uh, uh, I personally took the lead also in trying to uh, bring together as many diverse diverse positions as possible. I reached out to, uh, and I want to emphasize that I reached out to uh, people who are uh, supportive of made for mental illness, uh, more than five six uh, psychiatrists and physicians, uh, people from the Canadian. As the Association of Beta Assistant Providers were invited, I invited Senator Dalfont. And I again, I realized this was all this last minute. Um, I invited legal scholars uh, who have a, either explicit, explicit, were explicitly in support of the mental illness or were, uh, let's say, more moderate on the issues, but, uh, but um, uh, actually was not successful in doing so. And I think this is. Part of the issues that we probably will come up with today. This is a very polarized debate. Uh, I've participated in, uh, or I accepted to participate in other conferences where they canceled the meetings or the, uh, the session on made and mental illness because they couldn't find somebody who actually was willing to, to engage in a discussion on this uh, with, uh, with some of us. So it's a difficult issue. I think we will be as informative as, as possible, but clearly, we, I think. We have two divergent views on the issues of May, but but we certainly will speak more about some of the concerns, I think, than than uh, in support of it. So on that note, I want to um, invite uh, uh, Professor Su to introduce the members, and then we'll, we'll go ahead. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I'm just going to introduce our speakers very briefly because I'm sure you're all eager to hear what they have to say. The first one, we, uh, the, our first speaker, and uh, not our first speaker, but the per first person uh, on this um, on this panel is Orlando da Silva. Orlando da Silva was appointed Chief Administrator of the Administrative Tribunal's Support Service of Canada on October 28, 2019. In 2019, Mr. Da Silva was a venture or a governor of the Law Society of Ontario, which regulates Ontario's 55,000 lawyers and 12,000 paralegals. From 2014 to 2015, he served as president and CEO of the Ontario Bar Association. And during his tenure, he championed a Canada-wide mental health and wellness campaign targeted at the legal profession, speaking publicly about his own experience overcoming depression that has led to a successful and rewarding personal and professional life. Um, the next one is uh, Dr. Sono Gain, is chief, who is the Chief of Psychiatry at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, one of Canada's top medical academic institutions. He's a professor and governor at the University of Toronto and a member of the University Executive. His clinical expertise is psycho-oncology and he chaired the main team at his former hospital. 
Dr. Gain is a past president of the Canadian Psychiatric As Association and the Ontario Psychiatric Association. As uh, many policies have been evolving in Canada, Dr. Gain has testified before numerous parliamentary and Senate committees, was selected to sit on the Council of Canadian Academies uh, expert panel on ex mental disorders and assisted dying. It was also retained as an expert by the former Attorney General of Canada and has spoken across the country and internationally on issues relevant to mental health and mental illness um, and mental illness that need to be considered in any main framework. He believes medical experts have an obligation to help guide health policies with evidence, not just ideology, and to consider the impact of public policies on the most marginalized to avoid perpetuating policies of uh, privilege. Um, our next speaker is Terry Jolte, is a human rights lawyer at Arch Disability Law Center. She has been involved in disability rights litigation at various tribunals and courts. She has presented law reform and policy submissions about disability law issues to legislative committees, governments, and the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Terry often delivers extensive public legal education to diverse disability communities and has guest lectured on disability rights issues. Before joining ARCH, Terry worked on housing rights, social assistance, immigration and refugee law, human trafficking, and as a law clerk to superior court judges. Our next speaker uh, is Georgia Bratis. Um, I'm going to make both this um, pronunciation. Is a professor at the Departement de Psychoeducation et Travail Social of the Université du Québec à Trois-Rivières in Quebec, Canada. She obtained her PhD in community psychology at the Université du Québec à Montréal. She is a member of the Center for Research and Intervention on Suicide, Ethical Issues, and End of Life Practice. Professor Bratis is a clinical psychologist as well as a researcher specializing in positive mental health, indigenous mental health, mental illness, and suicide prevention. She also lives with a bipolar disorder and advocates for breaking the stigma around mental illness, addressing the root causes of mental health problems, and helping those with mental illnesses live better lives. And finally, we have Professor Trudeau Lemons, who's a professor and show chair in health law and policy at the Faculty of Law and the Dalalina School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He was a member of the Council of Canadian Academies Expert Panel on Medical Assistance in Dying and testified as an expert witness for the Federal Attorney General in the Trishon case. He has appeared before Canadian parliamentary committees mandated to discuss draft legislation and the review of the practice. He has also been consulted as an expert on these issues internationally, including as a witness for the UK House of Commons, Health and Social Care Committee, a Jersey Citizen Jury, an Irish Parliamentary Committee, and a South African Human Rights Organization. And as a member of an expert committee for the Jersey government, he co-authored a report on legal and ethical issues of department uh, different options of legalized assisted dying. He's also a content advisor for a broad consultation on assisted dying organized by the UK Newfield Council on Ethics. He's a member also of the main dev review panel of the Ontario Partners Office. So without further ado, um, perhaps we can ask uh, Professor Lemons to sort of, to speak first and uh, set the table uh, for our discussion today. Yes, so thank you uh, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, I want to set the stage first. Uh, some, uh, some of you may be very on top of the issues and may know very well what happened, but I think for those who are listening in, particularly also uh, or who are here who haven't followed so closely the event, uh, it's interesting to quickly recap as a start of this panel on made and mental illness, where we come from. So I will do so. This is, will be primarily prescriptive. I mean, you'll see some of the points that I want to make, but I will, I will uh, try to res re restrain from more detailed uh, uh, discussion of the issues uh, until the question period. So first of all, we had obviously in 2015, the Carter decision. Carter decision by the Supreme Court, which is actually one of the where international uh, Supreme Court decisions that invalidated the, in this case, the um, provisions dealing with aiding and abetting suicide and homicide of our criminal code. And the Supreme Court ruled there that these provisions were void, not in total, but insofar as they prohibit physician assisted death for a competent adult person who one clearly consents to the termination of life, two, as a grievous and irreducible medical condition. 
that causes injury suffering that is intolerable to the individual and the circumstances of his or her condition. This decision, when the decision came out in 2015, it was interpreted by many, by several colleagues, very broadly. And the parliamentary committee came out actually with recommendations that this should result in broad legalization of, of what quickly became called medical assistance and died. Other scholars, uh, including myself, emphasized that the Supreme Court uh, decision contained specific restrictive elements. For example, the court declared that it intended in its decision to respond to the factual circumstances of the case, which was a case for the person on a trajectory towards death. And the court also said we make no pronouncements on other situations where physician assisted dying may be sought. The court also exceptionally accepted evidence to be produced in uh, before the Supreme Court on arguably changing circumstances in the very few jurisdictions. At the time, there were primarily, I would say, two jurisdictions that had more broad euthanasia uh, practices, legalized practice, which was Belgium and Netherlands. And it accepted to hear evidence of, of what the government at the time, the Attorney General had argued were changing circumstances there that were not discussed at the trial court level. And the court ruled that they, yes, they heard this evidence, but they said, um, we will not have to deal with this uh, because euthanasia for minors or persons with psychiatric disorders does not fall within the parameters suggested in these reasons. Furthermore, the, the court also referred to the developments in Belgium as being the problems identified or allegedly identified by the witness were the result of an oversight body exercising discretion in the interpretation of the safeguards and restrictions in the Belgian legislative regime. The discretion the Belgian parliament had, has not moved to restrict. In other words, Supreme Court was saying, you know, they have made a certain decisions. We will have to see what our parliament does, but we don't have to actually um, have an oversight body which leaves and, and, and a law that leaves so much room for interpretation. That was at least missed. Some of us not saw in that. And as often, the Supreme Court said, constitutional, in the, uh, with respect to the constitutional dialogue, complex regulatory regimes are better created by parliament than by the courts. Lengthly, the response to Carter was Bill C 14 in 2016. It introduced, it followed basically, took over the parameters of the Supreme Court decision, but it provided a definition of a grievous and irremediable medical condition that became controversial because it introduced a couple of elements. You have to have a, you have to have a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability. Two, an irreversible decline of capability. And three, enduring physical or psychological suffering. Four, and that was the most controversial issue, a reasonable foreseeable natural death. Now, this was a broad term, and it actually led very, very quickly to very broad practice of um, people receiving MAID who had sometimes years of life left. It was explicitly accepted in the system as being a broad term. And the justification for what you could call a so-called end-of-life context by the government was, and I quote here from the statement by the government, the significant and continuing public health issue of suicide, the guard against death being seen as a solution to all forms of suffering and to counter negative perceptions about the quality of life of persons who are elderly, ill, or disabled. The government also accepted, or the parliament accepted, to introduce in the legislation a study of the evidence with respect to the controversial areas of main for mental illness, advanced requests for, for medical assistance and dying, and made for mature minors. Council of Canadian Academies, of two of us were a uh, member of uh, some of the subcommittees actually studied the evidence in relation to these three areas. Third um, element in the, in the development of the legislation it was a Touchon case in 2019. The Touchon case was a lower court in, in Quebec, Cour uh, Supérieure of, the, of, of uh, Quebec, where Justice Baudouin rejected explicitly stated goals of the law, uh, which she uh, argued were more expressing value and were not explicit goals of the reasonable foreseeable natural death restrictions. For example, the need to avoid negative perceptions of the quality of life of persons who are elderly, ill, or disabled, the equal value of all lives, and suicide prevention as a public health goal. She stated these were, in her view, merely vehicles used to affirm social values or stakes. <clears throat> and in my view, uh, 
Um, this meant that concerns about broader contextual and structural factors associated with ableism as well as uh, the impact on suicide prevention were arguably given less attention in the judgment in the discussion of the proportionality. Um, and the ruling of Justice Boudouin was that both the Quebec end of life uh, criterion, Quebec actually had already before the federal government issued a law, it, 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 uh, adopted a law which uh, allowed medical assistance in dying. Um, so both the end of life criterion in the Quebec law and the reasonable foreseeable natural death provisions were deemed unjustifiable infringements of the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and I think more controversially, certainly also the equality rights of uh, Jean Truchon and Nicole Babu, two persons with physical disabilities, but who are arguably not approaching their natural death. Now, there is, we could have a discussion around whether that was, um, whether this this case would also have been decided in other provinces in the same way, but I'll leave that for the question period. Justice Baudrillard declared the reasonable for simple natural that safeguard unconstitutional. It partly went six months with just the criminal code, and actually the court prolonged that period twice. Fourth element, and I'm close to the end of my my uh, time, but it's important to kind of put that into context. How how fast everything happened. Uh, we're talking now um, 2021, 2020-2021, in the midst of the pandemic. The government says we need to enact legislation here in response to Trichon. Keep in mind, its lower court decision would not have been binding outside of the province. Legislative response introduced uh, track two. Reasonable foreseeable natural death was not taken out of the law, but was no longer an explicit requirement for all forms of medical assistance to die. So the track two system was introduced for people who are not approaching their natural death, and in other words, have years or decades of life left with some additional procedural safeguards, a 90-day assessment period, some additional informed consent requirements, and um, an evaluation by a healthcare provider with an expertise in the condition of the patient. It originally, interestingly, and this is important to put on the table, it excluded made for mental illness. And the charter statement that accompanied the initial bill by the government referred to the inherent risks and complexity of made for mental illness, the un unpredictable disease progression of mental illness, and broad concerns related, including uh, to uh, broad concerns, including concerns related to suicide prevention. So, mental illness concerns were not discussed in detail at the House of Commons debate because it was not part of the bill. It goes to the Senate. We have. Uh, senators under the leadership of Senator Kutcher introducing an amendment to allow made for sole reasons of mental illness. And they introduced a sunset provision of 18 months, which the government later accepted to be uh, two years. It goes back to the House. And in one afternoon, the bill with the amendment slightly changed, but accepted basically was added to the bill. And the bill goes through. And so we had a new law which said. That in two years, we would start the practice of made for mental illness. In the meantime, we had a federal expert panel on made for mental illness. We had uh, some of the same people who were involved in the federal expert panel uh, being involved also in the development of model practice standards. Um, things happened, discussion happened. But then quite recently, I think spurred by, not I think, I mean, I spurred by letters of uh, provincial ministers of, um, of health spurred also by broad concerns expressed in the mental health community. Some of us met with liberal MPs, uh, but many experts from the mental health community expressing concern about the fact that this would start, this practice would start uh, now in March 2024. It was actually prolonged by one year. And so um, the government decided to all again uh, an expert panel, joint expert panel, to discuss whether Canada was ready to implement made for mental illness. And um, this panel had hearings for in, in November, October, November, issued a report very quickly. Um, um, it, more than 400 submissions were, were, were produced, actually submitted to Parliament, but they were not integrated in the report. 
because they couldn't be translated on time. So the report basically relied primarily on expert witness testimony and then came out with a recommendation that made for mental illness should further be suspended for another two years with a potential one year prolongation. So um, the report had dissenting opinions, which I should, should simply mention, dissenting opinions by Senator Kutcher, Senator Migi, and Senator Wallen, who rejected the recommendation of the committee. And Senator Dalton actually recommended a, a reference to the Supreme Court instead of immediately um, uh, expanding or, or suspending again made for mental illness. This is currently being debated. So here I'll stop. I already uh, digressed for a long time. I'll, I'll keep more silent during the question period. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Son Game. Thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. As Trudeau said earlier, this could not be more timely. Things are being uh, kind of debated, discussed, and excited in imminent, as we speak. So I'll give a little bit of background because I think that in terms of these discussions in any academic talk to give a disclosure of their conflicts of interest, this is different. This is something about policies. And I think it is important that we try to recognize our own biases that we might bring. So my background is I, you know, I never thought when I went to medical school that I'd have any discussions on this topic that I'm involved in. And that changed in 2015 following the Carter ruling. I was president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association at that time. And in that context, to try to bring some um, kind of evidence to the discussions, we started talking with members, consulting, et cetera. And I didn't have a foregone opinion about how I felt about made in general. I'll start with that. I will point out I'm not a conscientious objector. I had actually been the physician chair of my former hospital's made team. I would not have done that if I was a conscientious objector. At the same time, what I can say is that my backgrounds have sensitized me to some of the extreme dangers that I see happening with the expansions that are occurring, that have occurred, and that are planning for the future. And so that's sort of my background. And in terms of any ideological position, I frankly would say that what I try to abide by is to bring evidence to the discussions and then try to listen to what the evidence says. I have a problem when evidence is excluded deliberately from discussions. I don't think that's the way we should be setting policies. So with that as background, I'll start by pointing out three clinical issues. And you know, I know this is a law panel, but I think that the clinical issues about the medical aspect are crucial if we're to understand what we're doing with our thoughts and how they're gonna be impacting people. And the three clinical issues are irremediability, suicidality, and that the impact on potential particular populations, marginalized or other ones. And I'll say up front that I think the first of those three, right now at least, presents an irreconcilable incompatibility with our current main laws as they are structured. And the reason I say that is this. People sometimes think about, oh, what are all the safeguards we're talking about, et cetera. Well, the fundamental primary safeguard, as I understand it, is that it is supposed to be for a grievous and irremediable medical condition, meaning a medical condition that is serious, but also one that we can predict will not improve. If you can't make that prediction, you can't, in any honesty, say that you're providing made for an irremediable medical condition. And all of the worldwide evidence shows us that we cannot make those predictions in mental illnesses, in any individual case of mental illness. And in fact, the best evidence shows us that we are wrong literally more than half the time, which is striking because then you wonder what biases are coming into play when we're actually wrong more than half the time, literally would be better by flipping the point. So to me, that fundamentally is a significant problem that if more than half the time with things like depression, which is what we know most people get it for in the few, you know, in the few European countries that allow me for so mental illness, if in those periods of depression, when somebody is in a point of despair, we say, yes, you'll never get better, and that can't be an honest assessment. So that is a problem. The issue of suicidality as well then comes into play. You know, I'm sure that you've heard people give reassurances that we filter out suicidality and made assessments. Well, what the actual evidence shows us for psychiatric made assessments, made assessments for sole mental illness, what the evidence shows us is that those groups overlap. The ones who are suicidal as a result of their mental illness symptoms and who could benefit from suicide prevention that group overlaps with the group that seeks psychiatric mate. And we don't know, not only do we not know how to tell those groups apart, we don't know if you can tell them apart because there's that overlap. 
And so this is really concerning to me when I hear senior policymakers give assurances to Canadians that, oh, don't worry, we're able to filter out suicidality, when in fact the evidence tells us we can't do that. We don't know how to do that, at least not now. And so then you've got a situation where two clinical issues, one where we're wrongly telling people they won't get better, one where we're wrongly reassuring the public that, oh, don't worry, these requests aren't suicidality, and we can't know we're making that procedure properly. Who in particular does that risk? And what the other evidence in the medical and uh, mental health field shows is that in particular risks the most marginalized populations, people who have concurrent social suffering, which we know people with mental illness have higher rates of. So poverty, loneliness, isolation, et cetera. And so it presents, even on the surface, a potential obvious risk that our people are going to go through the door of MAID fueled by social and life suffering. And sure enough, we're already seeing that in some cases, even before it opens to mental illness. You've read the headlines of well-documented cases of people who have quite literally said that my medical illness was the foot in the door. My disability was the foot in the door. They might have had many decades left to live, but what pushed them through the door was their housing insecurity. And so when we expand that to mental illness with those other two clinical pieces, you can imagine what may happen. And sure enough, the evidence from the European country shows it does. Because unlike made for terminal conditions, which has a 50-50 gender balance, made for full mental illness has a two to one, two to one, 70% to 30% female preponderance, gender gap, two to one gender gap. And we think that that reflects essentially gender-based marginalization. The other concerning thing about that clinically as a psychiatrist is that two to one is also the ratio of women to men who attempt suicide when mentally ill, and most of them do not complete suicide and most do not try again. So they have that one suicide attempt, but don't try again and don't end their rights to suicide. And yet that two to one ratio is who gets made or so mental illness. So those are the clinical things I'd like to bring to the table. Then I have four additional short points just on process that are not really clinical, but sort of overlap. And this is about things that have come up in the discussions, discrimination, capacity, autonomy, and then some process issues. You know, what, what's been the most common drumbeat of why this needs to happen to expand to make for soul mental illness? Um, Trudeau mentioned Senator Kutcher. He's the one who introduced the sunset clause to the Senate. And he frequently talks about how it would be discrimination if we do not provide me for soul mental illness. You know, in my view, that's a somewhat simplistic view of discrimination and not entirely uh, kind of putting everything on the table because discrimination should be whether we treat things the same when they should be treated the same, but it also should be if we recognize valid differences that warrant treating them differently. And those preceding comments I made about the clinical issues with mental illness, those are unique to mental illness. Mental illnesses are different. And you know, no other medical condition has suicidality as a potential diagnostic symptom, for example. So the idea that everything must be treated the same is overly simplistic because it ignores the real differences that I think we need to recognize. And in fact, it flips the discrimination argument on the head. I think it's, in fact, the ultimate discrimination if we are providing death under false pretenses, especially to marginalized populations. And that's what would have been happening if we'd gone ahead as well. Absolutely. The issue of capacity, you know, I, I've heard many people who are proponents of expansion say that, oh, anybody who is expressing cautions, you're just paternalistic. You're just et cetera. And it's the uh, old school paternalism where you're telling people they can't make up their own minds. This is not about capacity of the person. Most people with mental illness retain full capacity and legal capacity to make decisions. But the assessors do not have the capacity to make the assessments they say to me. That is very different. When the assessor cannot make an honest assessment of irremediability, and yet that's what the patient is being told, that is the capacity that's lacking. It's the medical capacity to do these assessments that we claim we're doing. The issue of autonomy, you know, it, absolutely, that's a valuable principle we all adhere by. But autonomy, generally, I think, to me, means what I choose for myself. And this is about what society provides someone as facilitated as for that. So it's it's different. It's not as simple as individual autonomy. And then the process concerns, I'll just flag and maybe we'll come back to you later. But I will say that I have process concerns when something comes out of the Senate from one small group. And now, in the dissenting senator's opinion, 
they flagged that maybe the Senate wouldn't uh, follow through with the legislative path of the elected house and might be to protect against tyranny of the majority. That's a concerning sentiment to me if that's what the process is. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Terry Joby. Okay. And um, thanks, uh, Trudeau, for organizing the panel and inviting me to be here. Um, I agree with you, Dr. Gain, that we should, uh, with a controversial topic like this, we should all be upfront about where we come from um, to the issue. So I'll just tell you a bit about that uh, for myself. I am a human rights lawyer working at Arch Disability Law Center. Arch is a legal clinic in Ontario, and we provide uh, free legal services to low income. Do you need to talk louder? That better? Uh, so Arch provides free legal services to low income people with disabilities throughout the province of Ontario. Um, and so most of the clients that I work with are some of the vulnerable people that Dr. King was talking about, people um, with disabilities and often are on social assistance, um, are living in poverty, are underhoused, underserved, um, and you know often struggle to get their daily needs met. Uh, I also work with disability communities uh, across the country uh, on disability, various disability rights issues. So uh, that work is not, uh, it's not, I don't come in contact with um, individuals, but it's more about working with uh, organizations that advocate on behalf of different groups of people with disabilities. Um, and I work with people across all different disability types from physical disabilities to mental health disabilities, um, you know, sensory disabilities, autistic people, um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities so across the whole spectrum of disability. Um, so Arch, uh, from, from, I guess, the sort of fairly early days of the development of, of made legislation has um, been uh, public about taking a position um, against track two of MADE. Um, and we have also more recently written to the um, joint parliamentary committee that studied uh, whether Canada was ready to implement MADE for mental illness um, to let them know that you know, they're very concerned and, and that uh, Canada isn't ready and that made mental illness would be very harmful um, and damaging to uh, many of the many of the groups of people with disabilities that we work like. So that's sort of the, that's the position that I'm coming from. And I'll tell you um, a little bit more about our concerns and how we get to that position. Um, so I think there's sort of two, two baskets of concerns um, that we work around. One are the legal concerns, and the other are the concerns that we hear from the community and from uh, the people, our clients, people that we work with day to day. Uh, from a legal perspective, um, I think Dr. King, you actually covered some some of the some of the issues. I think um, you know the the piece about irremediability and um, and concerns about uh, the lack of precision in the law or the Health Canada guidelines uh, or safe application of made preventing illness. Um, so Dr. Gain talk, talked about concerns around the European ability and, and you know, the, the um, uh, really deep divisions, I think, in the psychiatric community about whether it's possible to even um, make a determination that someone has an irrevitable mental illness. Uh, and if, if it's not possible to make that kind of definitive determination, then there are real concerns about whether um, the, uh, requ the eligibility requirements of the legislation can actually be met. Um, the concern around uh, insufficient precision in the law or the Health Canada guidelines um, really is about uh, how do we, whether it's possible to tease out whether someone's under whether it is the mental illness that is the the driver the the, the reason that somebody um you know is applying for made it is is the primary cause of suffering or whether it is circumstances that other circumstances related to their mental illness that contributed to their intolerable suffering so i'll just give you an example of what i mean by that um 
you know, people, for example, a person who has a major depression, um, imagine that they, because of their depression, could not maintain stable employment. And because of that, you know, cycled into a period of years of not being um, properly housed or living with food insecurity um, and and not, um, you know, not, not being able to maintain stable employment. Um, and so that person who um, comes and makes a uh, request for me, um, the question is, and actually this question was asked recently on a survey of um, psychiatry, a national survey of psychiatrists and psychiatric residents, if that person came to you and made a leave request, would you understand that they met the track two requirements? Um, so there was, there was a lack of consensus on this question. 70% of the psychiatrists said, no, that person does not meet the MAID requirements because it is their social circumstances that are really motivating them around the MAID request, not their mental illness. 17% said, yes, they would. And then 14% said, I have no idea. So that's just an example of, of what we consider to be, you know, lack of precision in the law and, and not to lead to really uh, dangerous outcomes. Um, the other the other piece with the legal analysis um, that Arch has worked on quite a bit is um, whether the legislation, the current legislation, track two I'm talking about, um, and the expansion to mental disorder, whether how that um, fits within Canada's international human rights obligations. And here I'm talking about uh, the obligations that Canada has under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities which is an uh, international human rights law that Canada ratified in 2010. Um, and so agreed to, we as a country agreed to take upon ourselves the obligation to implement all of the rights in that convention. That convention is, um, is a human rights convention for people with disabilities, and it talks about human rights across all, all areas of life, um, but from a disability context and within an understanding of what those rights mean um, for people with disabilities. Um, so the, the first right in that convention that we're concerned about with respect to need is the right to equality and non-discrimination. Um, that argument is really um, about, um, at its core, I think it's really about concerns with uh, track to perpetuating um, sort of a, a sense of social um, ableism or a devaluing of the lives of with disabilities. And again, I think Dr. Gage, you touched on this, but um, the argument really is that uh, the law, the law, um, the track two, I should say, um, makes a distinction between suffering, which every human being on the planet experiences, and suffering related to disability, illness, or disease, and says that the suffering related to disability, illness, or disease, and there's something different about the nature of that suffering. And there's something about that suffering that is so bad that we can justify um, state intervention to hasten death in those circumstances. And we, what we understand from that is that um, it's that um, people with disabilities, um, there was something different about the nature of living with a disability, illness, or disease. Um, that is um, that 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 is bad enough to warrant state sanctioned death, um, and so that really is um, an idea that really contributes to negative stereotypes about what it means to live with a disability, illness, or disease, and um, you know truly does devalue the lives of people with disabilities. Um, if anybody wants to sort of know more about this or delve into this more, there are Twitter threads galore on this um, of people with disabilities really, um, you know, speaking about how they feel as a person with a disability living in Canada before uh, track to me and after to me. And that's not um, a point that uh, Arch has made. I mean, Arch has made that point, but that's not a point only that Arch has made. Um, this is a point that has been made by the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and other UN experts. Uh, they made this point to the government of Canada before uh, Bill C-7 passed into law, um, concerns that, that if Bill C-7 was passed into law, that it would violate um, 
the right to equality and not discrimination in the CRPD. Uh, and um, that position has been confirmed by the special rapporteur even after LC7, current state of the law that we have now. The other piece around um, violation of CRPD rights is around the right to life. And the right to life um, in the CRPD and in other international human rights conventions that Canada is a party to um, really uh, uh, talks about the importance of free choice as being a pillar uh, of the right to life, especially in the context of assisted dying. And so the right to life requires that people freely choose assisted death without any coercion or external pressure. Uh, and, to, and as does our law in Canada. And so to ensure that that is the case, our law has certain safeguards you know, that, that are in place. Um, we are very concerned that those requirements are not being met and that people with disabilities who live in very, very marginalized situations, persistent poverty, lack of safe, safe and accessible housing, social isolation, um, lack of services and supports in the community, and really importantly, people who are forced to go and live in institutions in order to get their disability-related needs met. People are living in those situations and their choices become extremely constrained. And it's very difficult to um, believe that someone has a real free choice when they're living in those kinds of circumstances and they really don't have any other options available to them. So um, I'll just read you a quote from the former UN Special Rapporteur. He also um, you know, expressed concerns about this. Um, and he said, uh, economic and social rights are actually really key to affording genuine autonomy instead of the myth system that is afforded in the law at the moment. And the myth system, what he's talking about there is the idea that you know, we're gonna make this available to everybody and everybody has a free choice. Everybody has an equal opportunity to make a free choice. So our argument is um, not everybody has that equal opportunity. I'll very quickly, because I got a, a one minute warning, I'll very quickly give you some of the concerns um, from a disability community perspective. Um, in terms of the individual clients that we work with uh, in Ontario, in will of disabilities, uh, we have had clients who have applied for MAID, have been approved for MAID, um, we've had a lot of clients who have considered or are considering applying for MAID, uh, and the vast majority of those people are, it, their, their suffering um, is really related to the social circumstances that they live in or the economic circumstances that they live in, uh, not pain related to their disability or difficulties in life related to their condition or their illness or their disability. Um, we've also had uh, lots of clients who cannot get mental health services. We've been on wait lists for mental health services for very, very long periods of time. I think that's consistent with uh, the data that we have from Stats Canada about, uh, you know, the, the lack of availability of mental health services and especially community mental health, health services. So that sort of context leaves us very deeply concerned that uh, expanding made to um, people whose only condition is a mental disorder will lead to even more situations where people are, um, you know, going down this route because they just feel like they have no real other options. Um, in terms of our work with cross disability communities across the country, um, I I can say it's certainly not um, uh, there's certainly not a consensus across disability communities around MAID, but the communities that I work with. And we are, I can say 90% of them are vehemently against made, track to made, and the expansion of made for mental illness um, for all of the reasons you know, that, that we've been talking about um, and the concerns that they hear from the, the communities that they serve and they represent around marginalization and, and being the social pressures um, and the sort of what's being called now the made trade life really. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. There's, there's, there's some other points I hopefully will get into, but I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, our next speaker is Raul Wano. Thank you, uh, Anna. Thank you for that, that kind introduction earlier. 
I'm trying to think of where to start here um, because I'm going to come at this question from a different lens. And that is to say from a deeply personal one in uh, so much as I'm a person who suffers from major depressive uh, disorder and have since I was nine years old. I wear a lot of hats, so I want to make it clear that whatever I say today doesn't represent anyone but myself, my own views. And I want to say at the outset that I am right now uh, against the expansion of made for um, solely for mental health uh, reasons, where it's the sole underlying condition. Um, I am part of the 82% of Canadians who believe that at the very least we should improve the mental health system first before we um, have this discussion in any serious way. Now, for me, uh, since I was nine years old, I would, because likely of childhood traumas that I've experienced, I would started a cycle that I recognized in my 20s, uh, looking back, that I would enter a depressive episode every two or three years that would sometimes last 18 to 36 months. I've also been diagnosed, in addition to major depressive disorder, with dysthymia, which is like a chronic low-grade depression. By functioning, however, which means that I could be very depressed and no one can tell. I could get all of my work done, never be smitting, never missing a beat or a deadline done 36 trials while in the middle of a major depressive episode. I've learned how to hide it. But let me give you a sense of what it's like because to be in a depressive episode, because unless you've experienced it, it's almost impossible to understand. Yeah. I, uh, with the benefit of... Um, the psychiatric community, mental health community, developed a 10-point scale where, you know, you can imagine 10 is the best you could possibly be, the best I could ever be or have ever been as an 8. 6 is my dysthymic norm. So that's my cruising altitude. If I'm down around 5 and 4, then the onset of problems um, happen. I start losing interest in hobbies. I stop socializing as much. I don't watch TV. I don't play the violin, which is one of my favorite things. I just stop at all. I sleep more. I disengage. I'm still at a point where I, if I concentrate, I know the things I need to do uh, to pull myself out of this mood. But left unchecked, the circle can continue to spiral downwards toward a three, two, or one. And anything below a three, I can't help myself anymore. I need someone else to help me. And so I've communicated this numbering system to my family, my closest social support network. And if they, if they could almost tell by the look of my face what number I'm at. But we have a shorthand for discussing it. Now, when I'm at a three or below, I'm in a very dangerous state. If I'm at a zero, I'm suicidal. May not tell anybody. In fact, I didn't tell anybody. Even after, about well, six years after my suicide attempt in 2008. Because I was afraid of the state, especially in the legal profession. Now, when I am in that range, three to zero, I spend between 14 to 18 hours a day thinking about nothing but the pain I feel and how to end it, particularly through death. If it continues untreated, I start to make plans. 
and I start to take concrete steps, which could be buying what you think you need, getting a ra- rid of stuff you you uh, there you uh, you cherish, people you love. I remember once near 2008, I researched suicide letters and being like the type A law student that I was uh, to see what the best ones were to leave behind in terms of uh, meaning. It it reminds me, I've spoken about this many times, some of you may know that, but uh, one speech I gave, a woman came up to me and said, I got to tell you something. Four months ago, my 14-year-old daughter Killed herself. She left an old. She didn't tell me anything about her other than this. I didn't don't know anybody's name. She said, I want you to know that in that note, she said, please, mom, don't tell anyone. That's something that marks me and what motivates me to talk about these issues. But in none of these episodes have I ever lost my capacity to make decisions. I could still do trials, right? I still made partner at a big firm. I still did a trial for two years that went for five. I still served as president of the OBA, even while thinking these things for 14 to 18 hours. Usually at night, I would fall asleep with exhaustion, wake up, and try again, and I'd say to myself, just push to the next day or next moment or minute. In 2008, I didn't think I could do it anymore. And I spent the next six months in hospital recovering from my exam. So when Dr. Gaines says that one of the things the psychiatric community can assure us is they can weed out suicidal ideation from depression and uh, engaging the state to help you die. I don't understand the logic. If you want, if you're depressed and want to die, that to me is by definition suicidal ideation. But I, I never wanted anything more than to die, just to end this pain. I failed, though. And I was so glad I failed. Because if I had succeeded, I would never have met my future wife. I would never have had the three daughters who have taught me everything that's beautiful. It's- I would not have had the rich and rewarding personal and professional career. I'm glad I failed. I'm also glad that MAID wasn't available. Each time I hit rock bottom in 1992, when I was a second year student here at U of T. In 1994, during my article year, in 2008, when I did it on my, tried it my own, on my own pen, with my own pen. In 2014, I am convinced that, you know, I am, I have a drug resistant, I've been diagnosed with this, a drug resistant form of depression for 36 odd years. We've been on over 40 medications. I've had 13 electroconvulsive shock treatment. I've been taking ketamine for four years. Is it true that I should have no hope of recovery? There are two important things that I steadfastly believe when I'm in a depressive episode. And I hang on to this tooth and nail, but I'm wrong every time. And that is, I believe that this is a permanent state and I'll never be better. Secondly, that I was never good to begin with. 
I'm a burden to my family. I don't deserve their love. I don't deserve help. And I'm not going to ask for it. But I'm smart enough to know that if I need to find doctors to sign off on this process, what to say, what not to say. And if they think they can find and weed out suicidal ideation from me, but I've got a hard plan to follow through, I guarantee it will cover it. So much. Um, last but not least, we have Professor Prates who's speaking to us via Zoom. Um, I just need someone to, uh, the host, to let me start my video. Cat and. Oh. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'll um just um sorry. Okay, uh oh god, I can see my scene. <laughs> okay, so um a lot of uh, uh things resonated with me um with what uh, uh, Mr. De Silva said and uh, Sonu as well. So. Um, in my situ in my case, uh, okay, I am a psychologist and a university professor, but I've had I have a bipolar disorder. I've had it for the past twenty four years. The only thing is that the first twenty two years, um, I was uh, diagnosed as having a major depressive disorder that was recurring. Like so, every I'd be on sick leave, like. A, you know, time and time again, and was were, was given uh, antidepressants, and sometimes no antidepressants. So, um, so once I would get from the down, uh, I'd go up. But I thought I was it was normal, like I was like everybody else. But it turns out that I was in hypomania, which was good and bad <laughs> because. Um, you know, uh, there's always, it's like that positive, but there's a lot of negative. So basically, um, I'm lucky, uh, because, um, sorry, um, uh, I'm very lucky because I have a, uh, a family doctor and at some point, mm -hmm. uh, in the past few years, I was really, really, really not well. I did just want to die, uh, complete and obviously they brought me to the emergency because it, the risk was high and then I saw a psychiatrist there who didn't see the bipolar part so you know once again I kept going and uh, and like I said I was lucky to have a, a, a family doctor and she really pushed hard like really hard for me to get a psychiatrist because it's uh, it's really hard to get one here in Quebec I don't know in, in uh, Ontario how it works but here it's very very difficult and I finally got the right diagnosis on uh, May 3rd 2021 and by a coincidence um, less than a week later I was giving testimony to the Commission Speciale Sur l'évolution de la loi concernant les soins de fin de vie, which is basically the, the Quebecois Commission uh, on um, end of life practices, including um, mental illness. So I was giving a uh, testimony about mental illness. So, you know, basically I started my testimony talking about, well, you know, I had the wrong diagnosis for uh, 22 years. If somebody had offered me, you know, made at the time, like uh, Mr. De Silva, I would know exactly what to say. My expertise is suicide prevention, so um, that wouldn't even be a problem. Like uh, they think it's easy to differentiate uh, the suffering of uh, someone who's um, suicidal versus someone who is asking for a maid. Uh, I'm not sure how they do this evaluation. No one, well, I mean, I've never, I haven't seen the way they evaluate, but, you know, having studied in suicide uh, and prevention, I don't see how that's possible when it comes to mental illness. 
especially since uh, one of the criteria, and I mean, like in depression, for example, suicidality is a criteria. So as a criteria, uh, a symptom, sorry. So um, like I said, if MAID had been offered to me back then, I'm pretty sure I would have taken it because it was, um, it was very, very difficult having get, you know medication that never, ever worked. Uh, so, you know, if I had died earlier, uh, whether it be by suicide or, or made, uh, I would never have gotten to that point with the right diagnosis, right medication, and, you know, getting better slowly, but surely, um, I just have to say that it's, it's not an easy process as, uh, Mr. De Silva said, um, I just got back to work after a nine month, uh, relapse, um, and it's difficult to find the right mix of meds. I don't know if they found it yet. I'm not sure. I'm just, you know, I'm going with the flow and <laughs> seeing what's going to happen. But I have hope. Uh, I'm also lucky to be able to afford a psychologist. So um, we don't often talk about that. We talk a lot about the medication aspect of it, the pharmacological treatments, but like psychologists or psychotherapists, I mean, our job, is to help people uh, who are suffering uh, find uh, some hope okay just a little bit of hope to to get to the next day to the next the next same goes for our uh, suicide prevention counselors i called them okay and i didn't want because hello i am a i didn't want anyone to recognize me same thing when i went to uh, the psychiatric institution here in the quebec city I've had students there who are working there. I have colleagues who are there. It, w it was like the shame of like, what if I see people? And of course I saw everybody, but um, I was like, hey, you know, it, what, what can I do, you know? And at the same time, I realized that would help this, I work on stigma. So people could see that, you know, even if you have a PhD and your professor and your psychologist, you know, you can hit rock bottom so um so that the thing is we can't forget that uh there are people like professionals who are specialists uh of s human suffering so i mean this is what we do um uh and we we try to help people and like i mean i can't imagine telling a client like i'm sorry you know um your depression is uh, really bad and it's ne you're never going to recover. So, you know, here's made. I mean, that goes against everything that, you know, I've been trained to do. I mean, if my psychologist spoke to me like that, I'd really find out, I'd be like, okay, there's no hope. You know, if she can't, if she can't see hope, then there's something wrong. So in Quebec, uh, luckily, and uh, I really worked hard on my testimony we had like 20 minutes so it was an, a lot of time and uh, they in in the report they said that they uh, they gave as an example you know getting the wrong diagnosis not knowing about uh, the difference with suicide all the stuff that we've been talking about you know, so that was a uh, win for people uh, for people like me and uh, obviously other mental health professionals um and th there's a point i have to make also um you know we talk about like ir incurable irremediable uh, but you know it's like people are focused on uh symptom remission however like we don't talk enough about uh recovery as a process and this is not something i mean you could be really ill but if you have like um a counselor or whatnot there's a, a community organizations you know that help in that sense to help you find meaning in your life and reconstruct your life and your identity which includes your mental illness i mean it, it, you know doesn't mean your mental illness is what defines you but it is part of you and you recovery is under um estimated uh, and uh, very, uh, we don't talk about it. I haven't heard people talk about the, uh, the whole process of recovery, which is 
long. I mean, I know it's long. I, I know. I mean, personally, I know it is a very long process. So, um, there's something, actually, else. there's another point I, I have to make, and this is at a larger, like more macro. We've talked about uh, social inequality, social determinants, and, you know, things that obviously make, um, uh, exacerbate mental illness, exacerbate uh, mental suffering, right? And that's not something, you know, like the person or like the psychiatrist or the psychologist can can work on because, you know, those are systemic uh, factors, structural inequalities. And the ones who have this, um, well, to say that this is a public health problem, okay? And the whole made thing for mental illness for me, like, uh, political um, solution to a public health problem in the sense that it makes it like an individual problem like I'm suffering I'm so sad which is which is okay but it's also a societal problem and where you know mental illness is still taboo like I said I, I was like like embarrassed to go to the hospital uh, accessing services is like difficult i'm really really lucky okay and people say oh yeah 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 like uh we can we talk about access but uh even like when i was in severe depression i, I didn't even have a family doctor i'd go on a walk-in clinic to get meds or get a paper to get uh, my um yeah, you know uh, what's it called Ugh, when you can't go to work anyways <laughs> uh, uh, on sick leave yeah so um so that's the thing. It's like the access to services um, is a big part, but there's also um, all the things we're talking about, poverty, um, not having access to adequate housing, uh, a job, etc. And those are things only like, okay, federal, provincial governments can work on. And it's not just the Ministry of Health. You have to, this is a, a huge uh, work between my the the, the ministry of um health social services work uh, uh, education i mean having to work together to reduce those inequalities so if i had adequate lodging and a, a job okay um i feel um i wouldn't feel as sad you know, I'm not saying I feel super happy, but I wouldn't feel as depressed. So uh, this for me gives us a message um, by the government uh, saying that we're disposable beings, you know, uh, we're, we're disposable because there's no hope anyway. So let's offer maid. Uh, there's uh, oh another just last argument that I have to make is, um, you know, we, we mentioned discrimination. Like, uh, we don't want to discriminate against uh, the mentally ill. However, uh, in, in, like in, uh, when they have to face a choice, I mean, of having access to MAID or not. But the thing is, we're discriminated against every day of our lives when it comes to accessing housing, a job, a um, good uh, salary, um, even just having like uh, insurance, you know, for um, disability, like, I can't get that kind of insurance, like, uh, because, you know, I'm mentally ill. So that discrimination argument, like, why do you care so much about discriminating against us uh, when we're talking about, you know, killing us versus uh, discrimination uh, towards us while we're alive? So that's uh, let wrong there. But uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Brockes. Um, we have a few minutes um, for question and answer uh, period, but I thought I would exercise my moderator privilege just to like ask one very quick question to anybody in our panel who might be interested to answer, and then I'll open up to everyone. Um, so one of the uh, some of you have argued um, that and anybody on the panel can answer. Uh, some of you have argued that Canadian law and policy has overemphasized access to MAID and not really the protection aspect. I'm just wondering if you can clarify uh, this, this statement. Is anybody interested in that? Um... 
maybe I'll say something more generally about this. It's just so it's my work. Um, so I, I think generally, indeed, the entire debate actually has been dominated by this atmosphere. You kind of look at, at how the expansion each time happens. I think um, the arguments were driven by the fact that there was, from the start, from the get-go, this idea that there is a constitutional right to be. And I think it influenced the Canadian debate in a way that it hasn't influenced debates, even in the liberal regimes that we have, like Belgium and the Netherlands, where policy was developed and a decision was made to provide some form of access to a euthanasia and assisted suicide, but where this was never recognized as a kind of a constitutional right. So the framing of a constitutional right, I think, influenced how we had expansion and then an expansion, how we have also in the policies and in the model standards that have been developed, and some others here can perhaps give you specific examples of, of how that has been emphasized. Um, but it but it certainly has been a, a threat throughout the parliamentary debates. And so uh, I, I I personally, as a legal scholar, was, for example, extremely surprised and, and troubled by how even medical professionals, when they were testifying before parliament or even in public debates, instead of arguing about the rationale for doing X or Y, the rationale for expanding or not expanding, medical assistance in dying in the context of disabilities in general or in mental health. Uh, it was always, oh, we, ha we have to do it, but, but it's a constitutional right. Well, medical experts, health policy experts, should inform the debate so that actually parliament can make reasonable discussions about, is it a proportional thing? Are there, what, what, how do we balance the rights of access with the rights of protection? And by, by overemphasizing this idea that there is a constitutional right, has kind of been taken over by health, health professionals who, instead of providing evidence about their concerns, would say, well, yes, uh, recent parliamentary hearings, yes, maybe we can't predict irremediability in individual cases, but we have to do it because it's a constitutional right. And my message to them would be, no, come up with the evidence. Let's debate because that's what the court should be doing. Maybe some can give examples of that as well. Maybe I'll just briefly add two examples because you mentioned the health cannabis standard. Um, there are examples in that. There are examples in even how our paid laws are structured. They're quite different from other countries. I'll point out three. One is that uh, I don't you know if it's already come up in our discussion here, but you hear all of these examples for people who are suggesting we need to expand about, well, people have been suffering for years and years, et cetera, et cetera. There is no legislative safeguard that actually requires that. In fact, that was something that the expert panel that was tasked with looking at made for soul mental illness explicitly rejected. They explicitly said, we are not recommending any additional legislative safeguards. So we're left with a system that doesn't even have TPR requirements, unlike the systems in the European countries. So people can get access to MAID when they have never had access to care or treatment, like some of the examples we In the Health Canada Center, they have a requirement in there that unless essentially you already know that it would not be consistent with the person's values and goals, if they could be eligible for made potentially, you're obligated to tell them of that as an option. And if you choose not to, you need to refer them to someone who will. I don't know of any country that has something that broad. The way the Health Canada standard addresses it, they basically say that telling somebody about need is not the same as uh, you know suggesting they have it. Other countries recognize it is very different when a white lab book comes in and says, here's an option. And when this is something that's required of everyone who could be eligible, that could be an adult with needs. And so there are and, and there are other things I think other panels can add to that. But uh, one last point I'll make is of course. It's Indonesia in Canada. The vast majority of cases are provided made by health providers. In some countries, if you're able to actually do the act yourself, you need to. And a healthcare provider cannot be the one from doing it for you. Even things like that make a difference. And if you think back to the Carter ruling, that was one of the things they mentioned that for a shortened life, if somebody acts while they still can, before getting to a point where they can't act for themselves, that was part of that decision. But now it's so expanded that we provide it easily for you.
anybody else that if you don't like what yes i'll just mention it's carrie i'll just mention just very briefly um uh the the most recent at least the most recent statistics from health canada that i could find 2022 uh, sorry uh stats can data um around uh med the availability of mental health uh services and supports in the community um long wait times for community mental health counseling and um, one out of three people who had a food anxiety or substance use disorder reported unmet or only partially met needs for mental health care services so you know i think that speaking to the issue of uh, the availability of services and supports um for me that's a that's quite a significant statistic Yeah, thank you. Can I understand this? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, if the if uh, the motivation behind expanding made to mental illness is uh, you know some concern about discriminating against people like me. Uh, Please discriminate against anybody. <laughs> you know, and I'm much more uh, interested in my right to life um, and security of the person. And what I'm asking Parliament, the Senate, and, and uh, the judiciary and people in power to do is to protect me from people like me. You know, when he just needs to have some hope to get to the next point of uh, whether it's remission or full recovery, give me some hope. Don't send in someone with a white coat saying, well, we can offer you an easy death. And, you know, it's, uh, you'll end uh, your suffering along with everything else. You'll never feel relief because you won't feel anything. I, I'm sorry, but that it ignores the crucial point at the heart of this, which is, you know, help me live. Don't make it easy for me to, to choose what my mind irrationally pushes me to work. That's all I have to say. Um, I, I don't fully know, but from observing and from being part of the process, what I will say is that from the beginning, I think that there has been more of an ideology in some circles that have really pushed this rather than listening to the evidence. I think that makes a difference. And if that's the case, then there's, um, you know, evidence can be discounted, et cetera. And remember that it did start not with deliberative national discussion, which came up to Senate Bluetooth's last minute sunset clause amendment. And that quite literally, to answer your question about why are we so here, but actually, I'll mention one other thing. It is remarkable, remarkable for a country to come twice to the brink of such a national and internationally publicized policy. The world is watching. And twice say we're going to step into the I don't know any time that's ever happened. So that in itself is pretty remarkable. And I do think that the policy or the process issues you alluded to reflect you know, why that is, because it hasn't been driven by, by evidence. And as more awareness has come out about it, I think then you're seeing the concern. It was a very small and shrinking group that drove a lot of this. And it shouldn't be a political issue. It shouldn't be a partisan issue. This is an issue for all Canadians. And I think as more Canadians are getting aware of it, they're realizing maybe we didn't quite get here the way we should. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. And if you have